Dear Christian friends and fellow recipients of God's command to grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, rooted and built up in Christ, grace and peace are yours, always and only through Jesus Christ. There is so much wrong with this world, so much that's messed up that shouldn't be like it is. But, like they say, it's important to remember at times like this that there have always been times like this. Well, almost always, almost always, there was a, a time just after God created this world and called it into existence and made trees grow and animals appear and made man out of dirt and woman out of a rib. When everything was as it should be, it was all good. In God's eyes, it was all perfect. And then came the biggest lie. Maybe the, I don't know, maybe there was already doubt in Adam and Eve's mind at this point, but it is the, it was a whopper. It was a sick, sad lie that the devil told, wagged right in front of Eve, and she fell for it when he said, you will not surely die. You will not surely die. And she believed him. But God had, in fact, said, eat this and you will die. So who was right? Well, the devil was lying, as he always does. But Adam and Eve cast their lot with the devil instead of God. And people have been dying ever since. Shame on her, shame on him, shame on the devil, shame on all of them. But the result's the same. People have been dying ever since. And also looking for reasons why these tragedies happen. Why uh, trying to connect a, a dot, make a line to say this one was a result of this. And specifically, this happened at this time because of this. And that's just something that everyone's been doing ever since then. Trying to pinpoint something specific uh, that they can be mad at or, or, or blame someone for. Everyone does this. Uh, everyone except God's son. Everyone wants to feel mad at God in a tragedy, no matter how big or small. Everyone except God's son. When Jesus was asked why bad things happen, well, I'll let you listen to his words yourself. Uh, in Luke chapter 13. Now there were some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. And Jesus answered, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you too will all perish. Or those 18 who died when the tower in Siloam fell on them, do you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you too will all perish. But that was the news in Jesus' day. That was the headline. Uh, those kinds of headlines were just as depressing as ours. Uh, the, the, Galilean, the Galilean people who had, who had been killed in Jesus' day, well, they were the flood victims and the school shooting victims and uh, tornado victims and cancer victims and on and on and on and on of our day. Uh, Jesus was from Galilee. Those were people from his home area. It's like the news ripped right from the Wisconsin papers. Uh, uh, Jesus knew when he said these words that we and lots of other people would be reading them and hearing them at lots of other times and places throughout the world, throughout history. And we would be interested to hear what he has to say to us. How we should look at the news and think about tragedies. We would be interested to know why. How could God let uh, Pilate, this Roman governor, give a savage order to kill people as they were worshiping? How could he allow that? And wh why did these people who, who were offering their sacrifices have, have to get killed by pagans and the temple desecrated in this way and, and, and just adding insult to injury? When these people had families and they had futures and they had dreams, those people who suffered when that tower fell over in Jerusalem, 
that freak accident. Don't call it that. Those 18 people were sons and daughters and husbands and wives. They want, they want answers. Don't just call it a senseless, ridiculous loss of life. That's not good enough. Give us something we can blame, something we can pin this on. Don't call it an accident. Tell, tell me why. But Jesus doesn't answer that question here, does he? As you listen to Jesus speak to the people, he doesn't answer that. Instead, he chooses to give a very clear answer to a different question. He answers it, no. No exclamation point, he says twice. No, to this question. Was it a comparison? Was it saying that those souls were more sinful. Was it God's way of showing the rest of us, look how bad those people were, that God would do this to them, that he would let this happen to them? Are they more worthy of tragedy and of suffering? And Jesus says, no! Exclamation mark. Sometimes you can draw a line. Um, you rob a store, and then you go to the jail. It's, uh, it's pretty easy, this and then that. That this sad thing is a result of that specific sin. Sometimes somebody takes somebody's life and then they go away for life. Yeah? Because God has put the sword in the hands of a government to keep the peace, and we're glad that he does. Jesus, of course, makes that point. He talks about that in other places, but that's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about making a general rule where you can say, I can always figure out what sin was it. Where did they go wrong? Why does God hate those people? You can't do that. No, Jesus says, put that thought out of your mind. It's, it's a lie. Like the devil told Eve, stop thinking that. It's not how it works. Nobody standing there around Jesus that day knew why these things were in the news, why this happened. Nobody could possibly understand it. Just like in our day, nobody sitting here, can possibly explain why. But if you're willing to listen, Jesus' full answer on that day will stretch you and mature you and grow your Christian faith in your understanding of how to face a tragedy. He says, no, a tragedy is not a, not a sign of greater guilt. It's not that they were uh, more uh, worse sinners, he says, than all the others. More guilty than all the others. If you think that way, though, you're probably looking down on a whole lot of people who have had tragedies strike them. Right? If you'd say the tragedy comes about because they're worse sinners, you're just glad that tragedy hasn't hit you. And you think everybody's pretty much worse than you are. That's, that's really what it's, what it's saying when we, when we blame and we look around for the cause. And it means you've got a lot of growing still to do. If that's kind of the natural reaction, as it is for a lot of us. Jesus is calling out those people of his day who think that they're better than those who suffer in this world. A tragedy or a loss of life is not a time to gloat. It calls for humility and for mourning, and for bearing each other's burdens, and for compassion. And it's good to let God grow that side of you, especially if it's not one that gets exercised very often. It's good when God matures that part of you, your reaction to a tragedy. Um, to mature your reaction, because sooner or later a dark storm cloud does pass in everybody's direction, including yours too, right? It's just how it how it'll happen in this world. And, and you could start to think back at that time, boy, where did I go wrong? Which sin was it? What made God mad at me so that now this is happening to me? And now you see yourself down at the bottom of the same kind of well that you've been judging other people about. Where did I go so wrong that now I'm, I'm being punished? No! Remember, that's what Jesus says. No! Exclamation mark. Don't think like that. that. That's a lie. Push that thought out of your head and replace it with what? What does Jesus say? Unless you repent. Replace it with repentance. Replace it with 
repentance. He says it verbatim twice here. Unless you repent, repent. In Greek, the word repentance is a mashup of the word for change and the word for mind. Change, mind. Change your mind. You see how that applies so clearly here when we're thinking and processing a tragedy. Every terrible accident, every loss of life is a reminder. Every hardship reminds us again, if you're willing to hear it, that sin has a stranglehold on this world, that sin has touched and ruined and infected and corrupted everything, everything in this world. There's nothing that's gone unscathed. But sometimes it's just the worst. And that's all you can say about it. It's just the worst to be in a sinful world that is so ruined and corrupted. That's all you can say sometimes. And if it's happening to somebody else, then it's like, that. well, sometimes it catches up to you. You know, who knows what it might be just in the, uh, a place at a time. Or who knows that working in this industry or eating this food, who, who would even have known or just this freak chain of accidents that nobody could see coming. That leads to a hardship. And it, it gets you. And you're afraid of it. And it's a scary thought to think like that, that this world is evil and everything's ruined and it's going to get me too. It's a scary thought, but our minds keep wanting to go there and they keep thinking down this route. All the time our minds are thinking like that. Well, what's going to happen? Or what, if I happen what if this happens? What if? Maybe that's why we prefer for our minds to be entertained so much of the time. Right? To be entertained and, 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 and consuming something else rather than spinning and thinking about this. We don't want to think about this. It's also why a lot of people turn to alcohol, and pornography, and drugs. It's often not because they aren't thinking. What were they thinking? They were thinking about this, and they didn't want to. They wanted those thoughts to stop. They wanted to see it differently, but they couldn't see any other way. And Jesus says, repent. Change of mind. A change of mind. That's what Jesus says. Unless your mind is changed about all this, it is too scary. It's too hard to deal with. You would just spin and cycle and not be able to deal with it. It'd just be too bad, too tragic. And it'd be like a self-fulfilling prophecy. When something bad does happen to you eventually, well, then you'll, you'll be able to interpret it the way you always have, and you knew it was going to happen like this. But what if there's a different way? What if it isn't that God hates you and that God's out for you? What if there's a different way, a better way? And that's when Jesus told the story. Verse 6. Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree growing in his vineyard, and he went to look for fruit on it, but did not find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, For three years now I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree, and haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? Sir, the man replied, leave it alone for one more year and I'll dig around it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then cut it down. Friends, you have a patient gardener. Jesus was mistaken as a gardener on Easter Sunday. Remember that? He, he had to say, no, I'm, I'm not. Uh, but it's pretty clear. It's obvious to us, Jesus is the gardener here, the one who takes care so patiently. Uh, he's the one who pleads your hopeless case. He's the one who, who defends your life, who, who begs for him to do some work first before God deals with you. Let, let him work on you. Let him do as much as he can do and let him work and work hard for you to do all he can to save you. Jesus is that gardener in this parable. But you are not the fig tree. Usually, we can kind of find ourselves pretty quickly in Jesus' parables, but not in this one. Sorry to disappoint. You're not the fig tree in this one. That's a good thing. Um, see, you produce fruit. And the fig tree in this parable did not. Um, at least it didn't yet. It kind of sounds funny to ask this, but if this fruitless fig tree were a person, what kind of person would that fig tree be? 
bad, a bad person. Yeah. One writer said, they're the wicked and unruly, those who pay God's word no heed, and they live as they see fit, smug, unashamed, without fear. They go their way, letting Christ preach how he pleases, but they do what they want to do. And that's just not you. I'm not trying to gloss over your, your faults. I'm just, I'm just saying, you're a Christian. You confess your faith in Jesus. You're alive, thanks to the Holy Spirit. And you live by that, that faith. And if your fruit of the Holy Spirit, your fruits of faith have been kind of less abundant than maybe they used to be, or less beautiful than you'd like them to be lately, um, well, God still sees that mealy and damaged fruit that he does produce through you as the most beautiful thing his garden could ever give him. That's how God treasures, treasures you. If you've fallen out of step with the Spirit, um, you may need some landscaping and some pruning, like Jesus mentioned in John 15. But that's different from this kind of landscaping that is here in Luke 13. This kind of digging and manuring and fertilizing and, and, and working hard on it, the gardener's already done that work in you. He did it maybe a long time ago. Maybe he used one person to sow a seed and another person uh, to water it more recently. But all along, it was God making it grow. God patiently working. God patiently doing everything. Growing up your faith. Sinking down your roots into his word to make you steady when tragedies come along. Sinking you deep into the vine of Christ. Into his word. Christ, who is your life. Where else? Who else would act like that around us? Who else would treat us in this way? Who, who in this tarnished world would pour energy into hopeless saplings, hopeless causes like, like you or me, or like this fig tree here, this wicked, unruly, smug kind of person? Who would waste their time on this? Why would Jesus stand up and plead with the owner, to let him work a little harder and a little bit longer on them. How could Jesus stay on face to face there and, and tell the story to people in front of him, knowing what was going to come next? Knowing how much he would suffer for people who, for people who des- didn't even want him. People who didn't even care about him. Not yet. People who didn't think he was worth very much. People who who didn't think they could be saved, people who didn't think they needed him to save them. The pain that Jesus would endure, all this labor and all this effort, what if nothing comes of it? What if it's all a waste? Folks, that's just kind of our cost-benefit analysis, the way we run everything. Jesus doesn't think like that. Grace doesn't act like that. What if this is a waste? No, it's not a question Jesus asks. Let no one who perishes in hell on the last day say, Jesus should have done more for me. Jesus could have done this or that. Jesus didn't work hard enough on me. No. It's not true. And at the risk of saying something that takes a lot of maturity to hear, let no one be able to say on the last day that you or I could have done more for them and didn't. Do I look down and judge someone as not worth my time, not worth my witness, not worth my energy or my words because it's embarrassing or because I don't think they're they're worth it or because I don't have the time for them? Shame on me if that's the case. Do you want to call times up on a fruitless fig tree? Because it's just pretty clear to you. They're done. There's no hope. Shame. Maybe he or she just needs another year. If God will grant it. Another year of, uh, not just of waiting patiently, but of working patiently, of digging and fertilizing and manuring. Some honest conversations and some tough, tender, loving care. 
that is what I need. When God gives me eyes of humility to see myself as I am, to see it, it's so painfully obvious, that's what I need God to do with me. How about for you? Without his patience, where would I be? <laughs> Without his grace, but for his grace, what could we ever do or produce that would please God? But for that mind change of repentance that God is the only one who works. Except for that, how could we, how could we live? We too would perish. With no one else to blame. So I know it's tough to think about this stuff, but I don't know, would you consider yourself a grown up? Grown up in the word? Matured? Cultivated? Producing fruit in the way that you see tragedies? In the way that you see unbelievers? It takes a lot of maturity to see people and see the things around us the way that Jesus describes here. Maybe you have more growing to do. It takes a ton of Christian maturity to hear a chapter of the Bible like this one. It's not the easiest one to chew on. It stretches you. It's not natural to think like this. It throws our natural way of thinking out the window. God has to cultivate this mind change. But here is how he grows your maturity. Here is how he grows your faith with a chapter like this, so full of Jesus' honesty about your future. So full of Jesus' promises about how patient God is with people. I'm thankful for you, my Bethel family, when I write out times of tragedy and hardship. And when I pray, I pray for all of us that, that God would not stop using his word to change our hearts, to change our way of thinking, so that we see the people around us the way he sees them, so that we see the events in the news the way he thinks about them. I pray that God never stops digging and manuring and fertilizing around us to keep us fruitful. And I pray that whether this week brings you tragedy or a chance to testify about Jesus, that you handle it with love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. The God who planted your faith and caused it to grow will keep working on it. May he keep you faithful to him and fill you with the peace that passes all understanding through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.